most people will tell you there's nothing quite like an Indian wedding. Lavish, extravagant, colorful, week-long festivities. With Indian weddings, it's not just about the couple getting married, it's about the families coming together and the families are actually getting married. Indian weddings are a huge, huge event, so they're a week long, the budgets are extravagant, everything's above and beyond. 100,000 is average now, starting, fair minimum. It doesn't surprise us, it well, shocks us, it shocks me every time I think about that because when I got married, it was such a modest affair, I would never want to get married in this generation because it's just there's so much pressure there's so much pressure to keep up with the, the joneses. joneses there's so much pressure to like outdo the the last bride i feel like it's just so grand i love attending these weddings i love being a guest but to have the responsibility of being a bride it's a lot on your shoulders So you wanted to have a turban tire, did you? Yeah, we'll need someone professional to tie okay. the turban uh, in the morning. It's one month before doctors Roop Desi and Suk Brar say I do. Their wedding planner, Harpreet Patel, holds a meeting with both sides of the family. So as soon as um, this meeting's over, I will text Joe. He does um, a lot of the um, majority of the turban tying and he's around in that 250 price range. And then if you have additional people that want to tie turbans, then it's just additional. You're not doing a horse. Are you thinking of dual player or something? Oh, no, no, I didn't say we're not... Uh... We, you know what, what? We're, it's still open for discussion oh, okay. of what, how he's coming. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't okay, know if we okay. had mentioned, we had discussed. I think we initially, when we first met with Harpreet, yeah. we talked about not wanting it. Remember that guy who fell oh, off okay. the horse? Yes. And that's oh, yeah. We, we just, talked about yes, it. Yes, but, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> but since then, we've had horseback riding lessons, oh, and we've good. done yeah, no, lots I've, of... I know, I spent quite a bit of time on a yeah. horse since that time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then, you know what? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much <laughs> Olympic-level <laughs> equestrian. That's not funny, like... I'll be in Rio de Janeiro yeah. next year. Do you want elephant, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> We're not available here. There'll be camel. No, no. There'll be some kind of four-legged animal okay. I can get on. Every small detail in an Indian wedding is important. So when, once we start the ceremony, do you want anyone not sitting, do you want no one sitting behind you then? Do you want it to be clear? Or do you want, just except for Jyoti and Maninder, yeah. or do you want your families to be right behind you? Um, I want to get your guys' thoughts. To see how much they are, but instead of my family, Benjamin, Benjamin, Jana, Ben, what do you think about? जब तो तू तू सीधा स्टैंड अप खड़े हैं आपके तो आप बिल्कुल नारा बैठे हैं तो वो तो होरता ना लगना आसी थोड़ा थोड़ा जगह थोड़ा जगह मूली जगह बैठे हैं आपके पर सांगत की बैठा भी नहीं For myself, I have always wanted an intimate wedding because so many weddings are so large and non-intimate they're just not intimate and so for me I just wanted to have a personal relationship with everyone who's there and they're there mindfully and they're there to celebrate your wedding and to bless you and so for me I'm like well 700 people that does not happen with 700 people um, it might happen with a good 100 150 people that's that's how I would want a wedding I actually was the opposite I actually wanted to have a the big fat Indian wedding, have a thousand people, throw a big party, open bar, as my way of giving back. With hospitality and family at the root of Indian culture, a traditional wedding will have at least 500 guests. It's, it's celebrations, you know, wedding is all about celebrations. It's, it's like a festival. So they would want to invite thousand people. The ceremony started years ago, so and many of the people in Punjab were farmers. So it's working all the time, hard hours, long hours. So when people came together, this marriage ceremony is what brought everybody together. So it's an occasion where everybody gets together, they laugh, they sing, they eat, they party. And boy, do they party. While ceremonies have remained the same over the years, the parties have changed. <laughs> They've become bigger and better and a lot more expensive. The costs go to um, amazing venues that we have, the decorators, um, clothing, everything. Um, 
videographers, photographers, DJs, every single aspect that you want in your wedding is bigger and better in the Indian wedding industry. But is the wedding itself becoming more important than the actual marriage? It's unfortunate because even today, and it's the same as yesterday, everybody puts so much stock into the wedding, and I think like it's, and that's it. After you get married, everything's going to be fine. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, we hear about the stories of, about, you know, the fairy tale weddings and the happily ever after, but that's a myth. The reality is happily ever after doesn't happen. You have to put a work into it. And if you do it after the wedding, it brings it to a lot of struggles in the wedding. I don't understand it, and I'm also not comfortable with the amount of money that's spent in an Indian wedding. I think it's something that you can put towards a down payment or a trust fund or something to help support the couple or whatever it is. And I don't think that money should be spent in a wedding, but, um, so I personally had a really hard time spending a lot of money for certain vendors and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm still trying to like, mm, do we need this? Do we not need this? When you're looking at it from the outside, I get it. It's, it seems over the top. It seems like a wastage of money, some people say, and things like that. But it, when you're looking at it from inside, and we've grown up in this culture, the culture is number one. Um, family is number one. And we just want to put a show you know, for everybody. We want to make sure that everyone is happy at these events. Traditionally, it's Indian parents paying the bill. Most arrived in Canada as immigrants 40 to 50 years ago. They believe it's their duty as a parent to pay for their child's wedding. It's changing slowly. A lot of the couples are now starting to put a little bit more towards the wedding themselves, but usually it's the parents. And I think culturally, it's just, I mean, we're so used to it, so it seems like it's just, um, you know, something that we do, but the parents have spent all their lives working very hard, and I think it's really well known, like, all of us are first generation born here, and our parents have come, you know, 60s, 70s, and they've worked very, very hard, and I think now they want to spend their money, and they want to enjoy, and this is the one time in your life that you can actually put this amazing event on for your, you know, daughter or your son, who's, you know, celebrating the love that they have in their marriage. The six-figure budgets have spawned a massive industry, especially in cities with large populations of Indians. In Surrey, B.C., home to one of the world's largest Sikh populations outside of India, the business of weddings is booming. The biggest surprise to me is just that, that you could have a very simple job, your parents are just regular people, but you could be walking around with a $25,000 ring. Bridal fairs, once limited to variations of white dresses and tuxedos, now cater specifically to Indian couples. South Asian brides, bigger is better. <laughs> Their minimum carrot requirements tend to be two carrots to three carrots, whereas non-Indian brides will usually be under a carrot or just at a carrot. The stakes are very high. We're expecting close to about 1,000 people today. Dave Singh is an Indian bridal wear designer who came to Canada in 2008. The show would cost me, including the outfits, over $30,000. The stakes are high, the brand image is there, right? And if we book, like, say, 50 weddings out of this, that means we are booking a business of at least $100,000, right? Success is, you know, when people show up and they recognize you and they know the brand. Um, if my brand is able to bring 200 brides today, it's success. When Dave first started, he was working out of his basement. But business grew quickly. Now, Well Groomed is one of the most popular bridal stores in Surrey. 90% of the people, they would spend like $30,000 on outfits only. There is three to four outfits for the bride, two, three outfits for the groom, five, six bridesmaids, five, six groomsmen, mother of the bride, mother of the groom, father of the bride, father of the groom, brothers, right? So basically, an average Indian bridal party, there will be at least 20 to 30 members. Creating the looks for everyone and coordinating them, you know, with each other, is a big task and they spend a lot of money to get those looks. An average outfit at Dave's store costs anywhere from $4,000 to $10,000. When a white client comes to my store or an Asian client comes to my store and then they see the hand embroidery, they're blown away. They see that, okay, you know, this outfit is worth $4,000. This outfit has taken like 90 days in the hand embroidery and then like 10 days in construction. 
and then shipping, right? So the whole process is three to four months. Most Indian brides want custom designs. Brides come in for a consultation, ideas are sketched out, and designs are sent to India, where well-groomed outfits are made. We do lots of hand embroideries. Our, <coughs> we do not work on machine embroideries. We work on the, you know, embroideries that speaks life, that speaks details. So most of our karigars are, they have a 30 year experience or 20 year experience in the embroideries and they would put a lot of attention to detail. Dave says the outfits are all handmade by karigars, an Indian word for artisans. Our um, artisans are 35, 40 year plus and they have lots and lots of experience. Um, they start in their early 20s. This kind of work requires a lot of detailing. In Dave's first year of business, he had 12 clients. In 2016, Dave has 400 weddings booked. We have a lot of clients who would fly from California, from New Jersey, from Chicago, from New York, and places like Jamaica and, you know, uh, Guyana. And we had clients from Trinidad and Tobago. And business had grown uh, multiple folds every year. We have three locations now. We opened in California, in Fremont, almost a year back. We recently opened in Toronto. The label has really helped, you know, my bring my vision to life. And um, business is great. Back at the Bra residence, the planning meeting continues. Roop and Sook encounter problems with their temple. They want their own religious minister to perform their Sikh wedding, but the temple or gurdwara they booked says no. It doesn't allow outside ministers. So it was a process, and it actually really bothered me that why should this be such a challenge? I'm looking for someone to wed us, who connects with us, and we want a meaningful marriage and a ceremony, but we weren't allowed to have that. For Roop, the minister she chose offers premarital counseling, a taboo subject in the Indian community. We met with a yami um, when we asked him to be um, our yeah, uh, our priest for the wedding. Mm -hmm. um, we sat down and we asked him if he could participate and go over what it would, what we need to do um, to prepare ourselves for the day of the wedding because I have so many Christian friends and Mennonite friends and they go through workshops with their priest and they have to have a little certificate that they're allowed to get married. Not everybody, but there's some that do that. And for me, that just makes a lot of sense. And so I talked to Sook and Sook's like, yeah, he's on board. So when we... Uh, asked Bhutaj Singh if he could uh, wed us during for our wedding. Um, we wanted to we wanted him to be really be a part of our ceremony and put make make it make sense and help us get to that divine place that we really want to be um, and not get caught up in the aesthetics and all the superficial things around the wedding um, and the colors of certain things and that sort of thing because to us the most important thing was the marriage and the ceremony itself and what we need to do mentally and spiritually to prepare ourselves for that day because that's the most ultimate for goal for me that day is to marry Sook and be on the same wavelength and the same mental and spiritual level that day. Mm. Wow, I'm gonna have to... <laughs> <laughs> From a simple point of view, I knew that uh, for me to sit in the prostrate position, sitting cross-legged is very hard for me and a lot of guys, their lack of flexibility. So I knew the 40-day meditation would give me a chance to actually practice meditating in a really mindful way and actually be able to sit and and relax and, and not be worried about my back hurting. <laughs> He's like, well. I need to speak with a couple ahead of time. I have to give them a practice. I have to get them connected to this path and have them experience some aspect of spirituality before they come to get spiritual guidance and spiritual counseling and spiritual blessing. Because if you've never understood it, and that's the first day that you're looking to experience it, 
it's a bad day to start to learn about how to get married because <laughs> from that point onwards there's no more there's no more going backwards there's no more decision making it's it's done so i insist that i have conversations with the couple ahead of time because i saw that there was there was gaps there was a lack of understanding there was a lack of a deep understanding and connection to what they were about to do that day and what they're going to do for the next 40 50 years for as long as they stayed together Baltej is one of the rare ministers who can translate the sacred Sikh scriptures to English. He's well known in Canada as the first police officer to wear a turban in the RCMP. We discuss everything. We discuss, and my first questions to them usually is, why are you getting married? What is the purpose of you getting married? What are you committing to? Because they need to be clear about that. And if they don't know, they haven't put thought to that or are not clear about it, we've got work to do. And some of that may not become clear for the next year or two or three or four. But that's okay to say, you know, we're still working on some of that. We will need to be clear about that. There are some things that we know and a lot of things that we don't know. And that's the commitment to the unknown of the time in the future. We need to find your hair artist, which I've sent a few, like I've told you, I've sent yeah. those um, text messages. I'll send you the pricing. Um, I think our price point um, might change a bit, but we'll discuss that. Okay. <laughs> While Roop still searches for her makeup and hair artist, some Indian brides book theirs years in advance. Cousins Harp Sohal and Shannon Mann started a hair and makeup business eight years ago. We are bridal experts, fashion experts, stylists, fashionistas basically any girl's best friend who needs to get glam for a big day in her life. Basically with an Indian bride, she has these glamorous outfits, like they're so embellished, they're so colorful, and the hair and makeup that we do has to match. And their services don't come cheap. For hair and makeup, um, yes, for a Western wedding, there you're looking at about $500. For Indian hair and makeup, you're looking at starting at about $2,000 for the full package. But well, that includes a few events, right? Yes. It's not just the one event. Mm -hmm. You have like the wedding, you have the reception. Yeah. There's a lot of hair, a lot of makeup, big glam, lots of jewelry, and you're looking at several events that carry through a week, and the bride is the star of the show, so she needs to look flawless. Yeah. The entrepreneurs now have 16 employees across Canada. When the demand was there, where we were saying no to business more often, we were saying yes because we weren't available, that's when we decided, hey, we should get on uh, teams on board that have the same morals and principles as we do. We could now expand Pinkle to Studio, have teams. We can't physically be in two places at once. So now our teams, we train them personally. Mm -hmm. They are Pink Orchid Studio certified. All the hair and makeup looks the same. And now we have amazing six teams here in BC. We had one in Calgary, now we're gonna be opening one in Toronto soon. Through social media marketing, they've amassed a huge international following. It's so integral in the evolution yeah. of Pink Orchid Studio. First, to get our name out there and get us recognized where you don't have to pay for advertising. Yeah. It leveled the playing field worldwide, where people like Anastasia Beverly Hills was liking her photographs. And you know, these world famous celebrities are liking your photographs. They're now booking three years in advance and traveling around the world for clients. Pink Orchid Studio has even launched a cosmetics product line. It's a strain, right? So we have families, we are married, we have children. Uh, we have a great support network of family mm -hmm. that supports us, our husbands, mm -hmm. our children understand too. We're living a dream. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't have much of a social life. Our work is our social life. Yeah. It takes us away from home, but we wouldn't trade it for anything. We get so much satisfaction out of it. And I, I think our whole fa our families are quite proud of us, mm -hmm. but it does, it, uh, you know, it takes, we literally leave part of our soul with our brides because yeah. we get to spend time with them, with their family. We've developed this lifelong relationship. Harpreet Patel also gets to know her clients well. Between meetings with brides and grooms, she juggles dozens of weddings each year. Today, it's a reception of another couple. We've been here since 6 a.m. and now it's close to 5.30. We've been here all day, we're losing our voices, We've been, it's been a busy, busy week. We have all the girls here, it's a team of five today, to host uh, 450 guests for this one reception. So we'll have all the guests starting to come around 6.30. Instead of standard banquet halls, couples are now opting for more unique venues. Today, the Rocky Mountaineer train station in Vancouver has been converted into a reception hall. 
It's a huge wedding. There's a lot of money being spent. This is now the final function of the whole week. There's been prayers happening. There's been functions at both families' home. Now this is kind of the big thing. This is like where everyone is going to party. They want to have fun. They want to have amazing food. And they're in an amazing venue. I mean, the Rocky Mountain train station is absolutely amazing. An average Canadian wedding costs $30,000. The food alone tonight is estimated to cost 40000 Caterers have brought a makeshift kitchen and set up shop outside the train station. Fresh food is a must at any Indian function, whether it's naan or tandoori chicken or deep fried snacks like pakore. Quality and standards have drastically changed over the last decade as first generation Canadians have more choice and vendors have more competition. If you go 10 years back, right, they're like people were like just okay with the disposable crockery, like the plates and everything. But now they like really want the real China crockery and all that stuff, right? We have to be very careful with everything, especially on the table service. It comes with the first impression, like how we set up the tables and how we set up the buffet settings. There are 12 types of appetizers tonight. 11 types of salads, and 25 kinds of desserts, and the quintessential open bar. The preparation is endless. At 9 a.m. we get this pretty much as an empty shell. So you can imagine, during the uh, summer it's a fully functioning train station as well. So this contract is for 550 people. For an Indian reception, that's small. That's, uh, that's not really, um, that's on the, in the smaller range of uh, Indian wedding receptions. Your average line is about 800, they go all the way up to 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 people. It's really size and scope. Um, as compared to a Caucasian wedding, um, for example, your average wedding reception is 100, 120 people. So that's what really the logistics of pulling something off like this. That's where you have to have a staff that's on the feet. You have to have a large, feel our staff. We had about 70 people in here today, I believe. It's cohesion, it's making sure everyone works together. It's been pretty much in my family business for um, the last 20, 25 years, both decor and flowers. My mom's a florist and now she's, uh, she did all the flowers here and she does large scale event and wedding um, flowers. Her older sister, my aunt, started the decor company back in the, she's actually one of the pioneering uh, vendors in the industry. She started uh, decor back in the 90s when no one had a private decor company and since then it's just uh, grown and now I've, um, uh, I've entered the company, I've taken over a lot of the management, a lot of the uh, aspects of it, we're helping it grow as well as my business partner Sunny. You don't wake up one day thinking I'm going to be a decorator. Three years ago, Sunny Purwall was an accountant. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. I'd still be a boring auditor, sitting behind a desk. Most of their clientele are first-generation Canadians who have worked hard to build a new life in a new country. After education, marriage is the biggest dream Indian parents have for their child. We've had clients that spent easily $30,000, $35,000. That's not a big deal to them. As I said, the parents, they've been saving up their whole lives for this. 20 years ago, when there was no um, uh, real decor companies, what would happen is people would book a venue, they'd have tables and chairs set up, and there really wouldn't be any decor. There'd be simple linens, there wouldn't be stage backdrops, there wouldn't be structures, nothing, and that was the wedding industry here in Surrey 20 years ago. Once uh, private decor companies started coming in, and they just started evolving and evolving and evolving, now this is the north. <laughs> this is, uh, it would have been unfathomable about even 10 years ago, but now this is the norm, and now this is what people are wanting to build up. They want it bigger, they want it better. Much of the party's atmosphere is determined by one person, the Indian wedding DJ. And it's no longer just turntables and speakers. We just bought a screen that cost us close to $300,000 because it's the sharpest LED screen in the city. But it looks phenomenal and you can have anything on it. DJs are so important at an Indian wedding, many couples book them before even finalizing a venue. It's overwhelming. People walk in and they see basically hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of production in one night. Like, most people will save that for a down payment, buy a house or whatever. But you'll, you'll see that kind of money being spent. Asad Khan is a trained engineer, but seven years ago, his passion for music took over. It's all word of mouth. You do, I call it, I tell my guys, you gotta lock down families. Because if you're DJ the first brother's wedding and you kill it, like, you do a really good job. You have just locked on the business for his sister, his brother, his cousins, whoever was there. And then that family's only gonna come back and say, we only want DJ to or DJ Convict or whoever. It's a huge production. Like the amount of lighting and production that goes into a Paris package, you'll see at like a relatively large concert at like GM Place, which is like ridiculous. 
can even book a robot to entertain your guests. For now, as long as I think the parents and the grandparents still have that hold where the whole village needs to come to the wedding, you're going to see lots of big weddings. Most big Indian wedding receptions are held at banquet halls. There are more than a dozen halls like Crown Palace and Surrey, many with a capacity to host more than a thousand guests. We're doing 200 plus events a year, and uh, we do on the average probably about 70 to 80 weddings a year minimum. Uh, on the high point one year, I think we did 110 Indian weddings in one year. It was, it's, it's been a good business and it's just keeps going up. If the design of Crown Palace Banquet Hall looks familiar, it's intentional. We hired a uh, designer to go to Vegas. I flew her there, sent her on a week trip. She went there, copied some of the best banquet halls that are in Las Vegas. Particularly, she took designs from the Venetian, and then she came back here, and then we came up with this plan. And we, the whole idea was we wanted to bring Las Vegas-style parties to Surrey, B.C. We spent so much money on building the venue because it's what it's what it's become yeah. because the clients want more they want bigger they want better and they want to outdo the next person always that's what it's all about so we have to be on top of our game and provide this type of service for our clients over the years there have been some unique requests from wedding couples a guy actually wanted to come and land on my patio in a helicopter so <laughs> It didn't work, but he actually went to the extent of actually going to Hydro, trying to get approval for trying to land here, getting airspace. 40 minutes from Surrey in downtown Vancouver, Kim Trahan runs a busy wedding and event planning business. She says the rapid expansion of the Indian wedding industry has created a fiercely competitive marketplace. It's not about business. It's about just taking a piece of the pie. Um, and as a result, what I'm finding is that the, the, the developed businesses that have been around forever have a standard and they have standard pricing. And the newbies that are coming in are now saying, well, if so-and-so offered it at $1,000, I'll do it for $500. And, and, and it's, as a result, now these established businesses have to reduce their pricing. And so... As a result, nobody really is making a great living off of it anymore. Um, and it's just becoming in incredibly competitive. I'll send out a decor proposal and, with, and they'll take it to another decorator and they'll say that they'll do the same work and do everything for half the price. I feel like there's just so many decorators that come out of the woodworks. They come but then they drop like flies after seeing how, how stressful and how much work there actually is. Um, people think that it's easy but once they actually do it and they see the setup and they see the takedown, it's not that easy. Many vendors say industry standards are long overdue. The need for this is that everything is out of control. I think it's going to be the survival of the fittest. And I feel like this is a survival game happening now, and the people that don't get exhausted by the game are going to last, and the ones that are just exhausted, like myself, who are going to be like, you know what, forget it. We can't do this anymore. Seeing a need in the marketplace, Kim organized an Indo-Western bridal fair at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Traditionally, downtown Vancouver hotels haven't been a venue choice for Indian couples who find it easier to book banquet halls in their own community. But now, things are changing. There is a little bit of a crossover that's trying to happen between the two industries as well. I'm seeing my Western vendors trying to get into the Indian market, and I'm seeing my Indian vendors trying to get into the Western market. And neither one of them know how to do this. They're asking for our advice, asking us what can we change to make our business cater to Indian people. About 10 years, or even when I started three years ago, that was never the case. It was like when an Indian person went downtown, it was like, oh, you're not going to have the budget. You're not going to have the alcohol budget. <laughs> There's all these things, you know, that, oh, it won't work. Now they're coming to us saying, how can we take this crowd from here and how can we move it downtown? Hotel chains have contacted me. They just want to know how do we bring the Indian market into downtown. There is, I mean, business side, there is a lot of money in the industry. And it's, you have to be top notch, you have to be amazing at your craft, and you have to, be, you have to provide the service. 
because this is not just we're just throwing away money and we're like that's fine you're, we're going to give you this much money you the service has to be there and now i think the hotels in downtown vancouver are realizing that but with so much money at stake some wonder if the indian wedding industry is out of control we're seeing an increasing rate in divorces now too and i and i keep coming across so many people that um and i've and i have seen some couples who whose wedding we've planned who are no longer together. So I feel that people are forgetting the real meaning of marriage and are focusing on that one day. Um, and I think that these big budgets are probably putting a strain on their, on their relationships. Um, finances often lead to conflict between two people. As their big day approaches, Rup and Sook make a bold decision. The couple decides to change their wedding venue because they aren't allowed to bring their own minister to perform the ceremony. I think a lot of the times people don't realize, they don't question things. Um, they just go with the flow. Everyone else does it, so we'll just do that too, it's okay. Um, they don't put that thought and that mindfulness into that process. And they don't even think about, oh, there might be another option. I try to take a more 30,000 foot view and try to see the forest for the trees, uh, that I think this is just the culture changing. I think as we go through more of these discussions with the temples or the couples do, I think, I think they will uh, see light, so to speak. And it just takes those repeated conversations to create that understanding. Boltej believes fear and ignorance is keeping many Sikh temples from welcoming outside ministers. I don't know if I'm welcomed at every temple <laughs> because uh, all the Gurdwaras have their set sort of, you know, processes that they follow. Many of the Gurdwaras have, in, have welcomed me uh, with open arms because they realize that this is a service that's required. There's no point in sitting in front of the scriptures not understanding a word that being said, doing four rounds, and then going home. Baltej is not the only one who's being turned away from Sikh temples for trying to bring more meaning and awareness to the wedding process. Arv Graywall spent years trying to start premarital counseling courses. Then they looked at me and says, no, we don't think our congregation is going to like it. And this was one of the more moderate temples, and it just it threw me for a loop. There's so much divorce that was happening in our community. I mean, about 20 years ago, it was very rare we had heard about a divorce in the family, but it just started picking up. And it's like the more you hear, the more you heard about weddings, you heard about divorces at the same time. We do have a commercialization. We do have this uh, huge enterprise that uh, I think has seized our community where hundreds and thousands of dollars are being spent, you know, both for pre-wedding events and post-wedding events. And I mean, there are so many of them, I, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, but those are not, I mean, without what happens at the Gurdwara, the pre-wedding wedding events and the post-wedding events have very little meaning. They're just parties at the end of the day. Industry vendors also believe the pressure of putting on a big wedding is taking its toll. Unfortunately, the cancellations have gotten a lot more in the last few years. I think it's just due to people not knowing if they're ready to get married or what it is. Uh, year one, 2010, I think we had one cancellation all year. Uh, last year we had 11. Well, I did used to send out an happy anniversary cards, but we did have to stop that because yeah, things happen in relationships and things don't often work out as they are promised. People are getting married for the, the wedding and not the marriage itself. They don't really understand what they're getting themselves into. So it, it is hard for us when we get a bride ready. We had this, we thought that she was in love. Her and her husband had this great relationship, great connection. It was a beautiful wedding, over $100,000. Everyone was happy. Two months later, they contact you. Can you take my wedding pictures off because we're no longer together? Mm -hmm. It hurts us. It does. It, 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 hurt, it saddens us because we don't, we didn't want that to happen to that beautiful couple. While Roop always dreamt of a small, intimate wedding, she's now changed her mind. So we're going to say 750. We'll say 750. More or, as, less. more or less, right? Okay. Despite her initial reservations, Roop now wants a big Indian wedding after witnessing her cousin's colorful celebration. There's just a lot of love, and 
relationships developed with families that were lost because of this wedding. And so new relationships were forming, old ones were being formed again. And for me, I just saw such a beautiful thing in that. And I thought, huh, I can't have that in an intimate wedding, so what do I want? And so at that point, I said, you know, I came back and I talked to Silk and I'm like, I always wanted a small wedding, but I think I would ha be happier having a larger one just because that element of love and celebration is so bold in our culture. Why would I not have that? Roop and Sook are well aware of the challenges ahead. As their wedding day approaches, the couple remains focused on the true meaning of marriage. Underneath all of the pomp and circumstance, which is wonderful and we love it and enjoy it as Indians, uh, it's part of our culture, we're, we're loud and we're out there. It, it, the core values haven't changed over the last hundred years and just embracing it and finding it, uh, you have to sift through a little bit more these days I think than you used to, but it's still there, it's still vibrant, it's a powerful, strong culture and so this is the, the part of our culture that is definitely different. It's wedding day for Roop and Sook. I feel really excited. I feel like I've been waiting for a long time for this day. Ever since I was a girl in some way, into capacity, but I never, I was, wasn't one of those girls that imagined my wedding per se, but my partner and that sort of thing. But I just feel so excited and so stimulated and, and I just feel so supported. Like, I feel like I'm just in a bubble of love with everybody, all my friends, all my family, and Sook's family. And I just feel, it just feels really good. Like, I feel like I'm sitting on a cushion of love. In true Indian style, Sook arrives on horseback with a full live band procession. Yeah, it's a very symbolic thing in our culture is coming in on a white horse, a sign of purity, a sign of, uh, I guess, prestige, uh, princeliness, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Before the wedding begins, both families formally meet in an introduction ceremony called a milni. We had our milni outside where we had, or here actually, where it was a bit more than most couples would have. We had essentially everyone meet their other uh, counterpart, and uh, we wanted that connection with the whole family. After breakfast, the congregation heads to the prayer room. The 750 guests listen to traditional hymns as Sook waits for his bride. Both Roop and Sook have spent weeks meditating for this very moment. Remember to begin to visualize what it is that you want for each other. As you have been doing in your meditation for the last four years. Why you? You did not come empty-handed today. Why you? You came with your soul and you came with your spirit. Blessed and blissful. Why you? The four walks around the holy book spiritually bind Roop and Sook together. You are to always be each other's courage, each other's strength, each other's dignity, each other's grace. Respect each other. Find the language that inspires, uplifts, and elevates. One of the things about a Sikh wedding is that you are there present with your Sangeet, with your, with your community, and I just feel that all of my family and all my friends are here to support me and to witness me getting married and be present in my life, not just this moment, but my life in general. So I just feel so taken care of. The next day, the couple hosts a reception and Sook has lost the beard and the turban. So the look yesterday was, 
I was going for a regal, uh, sort of princely look, a very traditional look uh, from maybe the 1800s, early 1900s in, in India, North India. And basically, uh, tonight's about elegance, uh, hopefully, uh, well, def I mean, definitely, and class, and uh, sort of a 1920s, 30s era uh, feel. Guest experience and hospitality is top of mind. Not a single moment is missed by the crew hired to capture the event. They've even brought professional movie equipment traditionally used on film sets. This is a chance for me, my family, Ruth and her family to give thanks to the people that support us as a couple and as two families over the last many years of our lives and maybe a lifetime before and our grandparents and parents uh, and great-grandparents. And so this is a, a chance to throw a party for them rather than for us. It is mm -hmm. for us and we're taking time out for ourselves and we're connected, but really it's a chance to throw a party for the extended family. While yesterday's mood at the wedding was serene and meditative, Tonight's reception is all about the Indian party. Dancing, just letting loose and having the older generations and the seniors and the middle generation and the young kids, everyone just bust out, get onto the dance floor and that's when you see the fusion of everything kind of evolving and people are just, they let go of everything when you're in the moment and dancing really helps that. Before the night is over, a famous international Punjabi singer surprises the couple. Geeta Zeldar just happens to be a friend of a wedding guest. It's this kind of hospitality and generosity at the backbone of Indian culture. Why are people putting on events in Vancouver that are $100,000, $120,000 easy for over a week? It's because of this moment when all the families are together and they're happy and they're enjoying all these moments and these are going to be memories that they're going to have for a lifetime. I feel like people do get hung up on the dollar value, but the dollar value is so high because it's about hospitality. It's about making your guests feel like they are family, to include them in events mm -hmm. that are so pivotal in growing their family. Mm -hmm. Marriage is about it's about traditions, but it's more about welcoming people and making them feel that they're included. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a neighbor, whether you're a guest, whether you're a realtor or somebody from the village from India, you know, now that we are in Canada, a lot of Canadians will find themselves included in a lot of these events. And if somebody invites you, we do say, please go because you'll get to taste that a bit of that hospitality. You are not allowed to leave unless you've had like an eight course meal. It's about Two, two families coming together, merging as one, and now this these two families that probably never knew each other are going to be connected for a lifetime because that's what Indian, Indians are all about. We're about family, we're about love, we're about hospitality, and we're about really just bringing everyone in and making them feel warm. Whether you have a big wedding or a small wedding, you should take a look at what it really means to you. Okay? You can have this great big wedding, and nobody's saying you can't, but Think about what it means to you. And having this great big wedding is not the end all. So I guess maybe combine wedding and marriage, the two concepts together, you know? And it's, and remember that it just doesn't end after the ceremonies are over. Make it your own and own it, own the, things that happen that are very good and own the things that are surprises. My button fell off as we were getting in the, our vintage Rolls Royce to come here. And Roop, I didn't realize, had amazing seamstress skills. Yeah. I was able to sew it back on and thread a needle uh, with thread uh, just before coming here with steady hands. So definitely appreciated that. Uh, and take time for little moments and uh, have fun, yeah. Yeah. For Roop and Sook, the big fat Indian wedding was more than just a big party. The couple made meaningful connections through their cultural and spiritual traditions. Thinking about it and really feeling what is, what is it that you really want and having emotion, an emotional journey, envision it, dream it, think about it, digest it, and then you'll make it happen. And so that's what we did and it was amazing.